Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, it's one of those questions that people ask each other in late night, deep thought conversations. It's a, a topic for an essay assigned in school or even part of a job interview meant to reveal something about you beyond the basics of a resume. If you could meet and talk to anyone in the history of the world so far, who would it be and why? Some of us could answer that in a snap. Others would have to think long and hard. Most people would probably gravitate, gravitate toward famous figures, big names like Abraham Lincoln or Martin Luther King Jr., Napoleon or Julius Caesar, Catherine the Great or Joan of Arc, Karl Marx or Martin Luther, Marie Curie or Sacagawea. But others would make more personal choices. The grandfather who died before you were born, uh, the first woman of your ancestors to come to America, as an immigrant, as a slave, as a dutiful wife and mother, or completely on her own. Whomever you might choose, chances are good that you would be disappointed if you were actually able to go back in time and meet with him or her. Even if the same magic that took you back made this individual actually willing to talk to you, there would probably be some things that uh, you would find distasteful, disgusting, or just plain wrong and impossible to ignore, because all people are products of their times. That grandfather could be a horrible racist. That famous figure could be a misogynist. That pioneering woman might simply stink. That seemingly brilliant man could be intellect as intellectually stimulating as a wet rag. And what would they think of you with your modern attitudes and ideas, clothes and haircuts and habits, and perhaps your clueless conviction that you actually know something about their lives and the time they live in. Now, one of the people who probably most often ends up in the list of someone from history I'd like to meet is Jesus. It's fairly obvious, like, obvious why Christians would want to, even though we already know that we will be meeting and living with him when we get to heaven. But sometimes even unbelievers say that they would like to meet him, perhaps simply because he's a fascinating historical figure to them. Maybe because they're just curious about someone they've heard a lot about, or perhaps because they're convinced that the real Jesus is vastly different from the Jesus Christians believe in and, that they, and, and they want to prove that thesis. But who, who would actually be ready and happy to meet the real Jesus? It is not a, a new question or concern, and it is one that, that he himself addresses in our gospel today. When some out-of-town Greeks who are in Jerusalem for the Passover tell Philip, who tells Andrew, who, who tell Jesus together, that they want to see Jesus. Let's hear again how he responds in John 12, 20 to 33. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew came with Philip and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I tell you. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it continues to be one kernel. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Anyone who loves his life destroys it, and the one who hates his life in this world will hold on to it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. 
And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, this is the reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven. I have glorified my name, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it thundered. Others said an angel talked to him. Jesus answered, This voice was not for my sake, but for yours. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be thrown out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate what kind of death he was going to die. Now, just about everything Jesus says when Philip and Andrew come to him sounds like a non sequitur, like it doesn't really respond at all to the desire of these Greeks to meet him. In fact, Jesus never really even mentions them. But we know that the words that Jesus spoke were always spoken with good reason and for good purposes, and, and these are no exception. He is here responding not so much to the idea of meeting these curious strangers, but to the whole idea of who it actually is that they, or anyone, will be seeing if they see him, as opposed to the wrong ideas that they might have of who he is and what he's all about. Which means, in a way, that he has turned the tables. And instead of answering, can these Greeks see Jesus? He is asking a question of his own. Do you want to see Jesus? Now, lots of people then and, and lots of people today would be quick to answer, yes, of course. But it is precisely those people that, that he is aiming at, then and now, because there is a real danger that it is not the real Jesus, Christ as he truly is, that they think they want to see. They are looking for or expecting someone else. Now, we have spoken many times before about how so many of the Jews, including even his own disciples, were looking to Jesus and expecting a worldly Messiah, one who would become king over the Jews in Jerusalem and, and kick the hated Romans out of their land and restore the Jews, all of Israel, to their, their earlier glory. But many people today make a similar mistake. They see Jesus as the one to restore the lost glory of Western culture or 1950s American values or, or see him as the one to act powerfully to, to kick wicked politicians and evil celebrities out of this country. There is also the unreal Jesus that is popular among modern philosophers and theologians. The Jesus who is confused and uncertain. He doesn't really know who he is or what he's doing. And, and when he is arrested and crucified, it's, it's mainly because he's simply been caught unawares and, and carried along by events out of his control. And this is related to the weak Jesus, who may or may not have had a special relationship with God the Father, but, but who has no power to do actual miracles and is, is best pictured in, in their eyes as a scrawny and soft-spoken guy with a lot to say. But perhaps the most popular other Jesus in, in our world today is the one we might call the smiley face Jesus. This Jesus is your good buddy who never judges you or anyone who never asks anything difficult of you, who is always there to, to, to cheer you on, whatever you choose, do, or say, and, and whose greatest desire for you is simply that you be happy in your life today. This Jesus pretty much is, is, is nothing, 
teaches nothing, pretty much nothing but the importance of, of loving each other, of being nice. But he met a, a horrible end. But that was really only because he was too mild and gentle to stop it. Apparently his enemies and the Romans weren't satisfied with smiles and hugs. Are you familiar with any of, of those Jesuses? Perhaps one of them is even your preferred Jesus. But none of them are the real Jesus. And that's what Christ takes such pains here to explain. Particularly because the time is so short. Yes, he is about to be glorified when, when he speaks these words. But, but it is not a glory of, of wealth or power or the praise of people. It is the glory of an accomplished mission. A mission that finds success only after apparent failure. Finds production only after destruction and death. This real Jesus is one who calls one to deny oneself, to, to hate his life in this world, to give oneself fully over to, to serving the Lord and follow him. This is not a Jesus who says, go your own way, everything's good. Or, hey, don't worry about anything you do or are, you're just fine the way you are. This is not a Jesus who says, you know, hey, I don't ask for much. Just give me whatever you can spare. Whatever time or treasure or attention is convenient for you. The real Jesus calls us to serve Him. And not just serve Him, but, but follow Him. To, to follow down the same path He took the path of grace-driven suffering and sacrifice, the, the way of the cross. Not because there is anything of His work that we need to complete, but because this is the path of trust in Him and obedience to the Father. Is this the Jesus you want to see? Our sinful nature certainly doesn't want to see it. We, we, we want it easy. We want it comfortable. And following this Jesus sounds difficult. But not because of the hard work you'll have to do to, to please Him and gain salvation. Because this is also not a cheerleader Jesus or a messianic assistant Christ doesn't encourage or help sinners as they work to save themselves. There's no way that could even work. No, this Jesus does all the work of saving. This is the new covenant that we heard about in our reading from Jeremiah, one that is all about God's grace and mercy for the sake of what Christ did and, and not at all about our doing in order to earn God's favor. That's what the real Jesus came to this hour for. His glory and the glory of His Father and His name would only come from the completion of the, His mission. And that mission involved suffering and sacrifice, whips and thorns, barbs and blood, a cross, nails, and a tomb. He endured it all and suffered it all to save us all. He would be lifted up on Calvary, and there with his death paying the price for all people's sins, he would draw all to himself, saying, Here, now, I have satisfied God's wrath against sin. Your guilt is gone. Your offenses are all forgiven and forgotten. Death and the devil have lost their grip on you. Heaven is open. Hell no longer needs to be your destiny. Satan is banished. Trust in me. 
Rely on God's grace and mercy. Count on what I have completed. Know me. Know the Lord's love. Believe and be saved. And this, this is not only the only real Jesus, this is the only Jesus worth believing in. Because none of the others can can take away your sins. None of the others can offer paradise and eternal life to those who believe and follow. No one else can recreate you and set you free from the power of the devil and, and the old man within you. But this is a Jesus who takes things seriously. He smiles at children, but he also judges the world for its rebellion against its creator. He welcomes sinners, but never condones their sin. He is the holy Son of God, but still he suffers as a man guilty of all sin. He is a responsible Jesus who finishes the task set before him. A loving Jesus who willingly gives up his life for strangers who hate him. He is a Jesus who is humble and content to enjoy his glory on the other side of the grave, waiting patiently for his exaltation in heaven so that it doesn't interfere with his mission of redeeming the earth. A mission he accepted as the Son of God from His Father in eternity. This is Jesus. And He wants you to believe and follow Him. He's not trying to scare anyone away, Greeks or Jews or anyone, but He wants everyone to know and understand who He really is and what He really came for because ultimately that is all that matters. And He is especially making this point at this point because He has come to the ultimate, to the end of His time on earth, the finish to His mission. This is the hour, He says. The time has come. So see Him now. See Him in this season of Lent when we remember the pains and passions of His path to the cross and our redemption. And see Him at this moment because it matters who it is you expect to see and and why. You want to see Jesus. And seeing Him, the real Jesus, You put your trust in Him because you know He is worthy of that trust. And then, in faith, you want to do exactly what He has called you to do, to forsake this world and its values and attitudes and ideals and instead serve and follow Him, your Savior, God's Son, the priest who sacrificed Himself for your sins, the Son of Man who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. But this serving and following that you then do in His path, with this you commit yourself to, and when you, it is real service and real discipleship. You are taking up your own cross. You are associating yourself with the one that the sinful world rejects and despises. You are doing things and obeying rules that make sense to your father, but not to your neighbors or friends and family. You do it because it pleases God who loves you and because it shows your love and thanks to him for his many blessings. You do it also because you know that your Creator is wiser than any of us and therefore His will is always best. 
But this does mean tough choices and difficult roads. It means standing against the culture and against your peers. It might involve driving longer distances to attend a faithful church or being unpopular because you don't go along with the crowd. It requires denying the desires of your sinful flesh and not condoning the desires of other people's sinful flesh, even the people you love. It means being content to wait for the glory yet to come, a later glory that comes in heaven at the resurrection, not, and not seeking after a glory yet on this earth. This is just some of what it means to actually follow Jesus, the real Jesus anyway. But you do so in joy, and you do so in certainty. You know the Lord, His grace, His love, His mercy, and you know His Son and all He did for you. You know that all that the Son did and accomplished got His Father's approval. The voice that came from heaven that sounded like thunder when he, the Father says, I have glorified My name and I will glorify it again. And you know also that you are included in everything that Jesus did. Jesus was careful to say that when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to Myself. All people. Everyone. Everywhere of every time. That, that included those Greeks who wanted to see Him. So yes, He did get back to that. And it includes you too. No matter your race or tribe or language or ethnicity, no matter your age or class or wealth or education. This is the Jesus who saved you. This is the Jesus who, who, who washed and claimed you in baptism. This is the one who offers forgiveness, life, and salvation in His Holy Supper. This is the Jesus you learn about in His Holy Word. He's the only one the only one worth believing and following. This is the real Jesus. And you are ready and happy to meet Him. You really want to see Jesus. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.